Hi, everyone, and welcome to Heal Endometriosis Naturally with Wendy K. Laidlaw. Wendy has spent the last two years helping women with various stages of endometriosis to heal naturally after putting her condition into remission. After her own healing success from stage four endometriosis and adenomyosis, she's inspired to heal others, and her goal is to help some of the 175 million women know that there is another way other than painkillers, drugs, or surgery. This is the place to be for real talk with real people for real results so you can learn how to heal your endometriosis naturally. Please note that the opinions expressed in this program may represent options but are not a substitute for proper medical care. Before starting any new healthcare program, we recommend you consult with a health professional. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's uh, End of Awesome. We have with us today, we have Poppy. Um, she was supposed to be sleeping and she is wide awake, but I actually thought it was quite apt that I bring her on and chat to you about um, her stage anyway, because what's been really interesting to observe is the conditioning element with her. Um, as I'm trying to kind of get her trained up, it really struck me about how um, sensitive and perceptive she is to um, a what I'm what I'm telling her to do or what I'm asking her to do, and also equally, and she's been brilliant. She, she sits, she gives a paw, she goes out and does her business on command, and it really kind of got me thinking about you know what happens to us when we're little. As you know, this particular section of the alumni is about feeling it, and. You know, we all have very similar personality traits as women with endometriosis, where, where we have these perfectionist parts, these pusher parts, these very strong critics, people pleasers. And of course, all those parts originate from early conditioning. Now, some, I mean, as I say, these parts are great parts when they're in balance with other parts. But if we've not been given the, the what, what, what we needed, if those parts didn't get what they need, then um, if different parts didn't get what we need, we had to kind of overcompensate. Equally, if we weren't in a safe environment, uh, that there might be a whole load of different reasons for that, then, our, then some parts become more dominant than others for protection. And of course, I'm talking about the critic, our internal critic. Ultimately, its job is to, stay still, our jo its job is to protect us, is to stop us from pain, stop us from harm, and um, and we're, the way the human's brains work is we're always, as we're um, early formation of, of, of our environment and our perception of what's happening is done purely through our senses. So our, this is why, again, we've all, we're all exquisitely highly intuitive sensitive people, what I call e-hisps as well. We, and, and it's funny, I was thinking about this the other day as well. It's like, oh, look back to the old, old days when you would have different types of people do different types of things. So there would be the the um, the big sort of warriors that would go off and they'd fight wars because they didn't have the, they didn't need that degree of sensitivity. But the people with the sensitivity and the insight and the wisdom, they would stay at home, um, making sure that the people were okay and the, and the things were in place, the philosophers, the wise people, they had far more degree of sensitivity to kind of what was happening in the environment. So again, I think what I'm trying to say is, part of learning to feel the feelings and and accept who we are is accepting that our degree of sensitivity has its strengths I think that's what I'm trying to say um for for oh for decades I felt that my sensitivity was was a was a blight on my life was was something that I really wished that I didn't have um what I'm recognizing and learning is it's a part of me, okay? And that, that degree of sensitivity shows up in many, many different ways. It shows up in the food, it shows up in the products, it shows up in the environment and property. It certainly shows up with people. I'm very, very uh, sensitive to different energies, different people types, and of course the past. Now, when we're talking about the past, as I say, I wanted to bring Poppy on. I didn't really want to bring Poppy on because she's a wriggler, but she decided that she wasn't going to sleep when she was supposed to today. But I thought it was apt to bring a kind of live demo as to kind of how this early conditioning happens. You know, not only is she learning good things, she's also already picking up bad habits. And I say, I use the word bad in, in inverted commas. Um, I, I, I'm acutely aware now with the knowledge that I have is how important uh, positive reinforcement is. 
positive conditioning, if you if you want to call it that, is because it's and if we didn't get that because maybe our parents didn't know that because most parents just replicate what their parents taught them, then we're kind of already at a um, a, a default mechanism where we're, we we as we're forming as we're developing as babies. So literally, we're we're born into this world. We've previously been in this nice, warm, safe. Um, bubble of umbilical fluid and then suddenly we are being shoved out into the world we're probably having our bottom slapped and and we, we are like wow bang we're having lights we're having sensory overload and if the mother has had a, a, a very traumatic pregnancy or there's been tension at home we would have picked that up even just from the womb even just with the um, the fluids and and the energies and um, what's coming into the baby, um, already that could have been kind of preset the baby to be sensitive. So I think what again what I'm trying to say here is, um, I'm, I'm hoping as part of this journey there there's a learning to to acknowledge and accept the degree of sensitivity that we have as a major strength. It might seem a kind of oxymoron. It might seem almost a contradiction in terms, but it's not. Um, I couldn't do the work that I do if I didn't have the degree of sensitivity, yet I know the strength that I have. Sometimes people mistake my kindness and sensitivity for weakness and they, they try and push my boundaries and they, and they try and uh, they, 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 they misinterpret who I am. But then that's up to me now on where I am in my journey to put boundaries in and, and reinforce the protection that I need for myself. So as we are thinking about our early conditioning, it, it does pay kind of homage to almost uh, allow yourself some gentle thoughts as long as it's not too distressing or upsetting as to kind of what was it, what would it have been like for little you when you were born? And I say this in a very kind of, you can do it from a sensory perspective. You can even just, as I'm asking the question, you can think, did I feel safe? Even though I didn't have any language, I didn't have any thoughts, feelings or beliefs or any context as to kind of, you know what that meant D did i feel safe i know from my own upbringing um my, my mother used to tell me quite regularly that she didn't want children so i always had this feeling of, of being an inconvenience and and she didn't want me or my brother and it's funny because it's it never upset me on a surface level as in it never made me want to cry or anything because that was just a fact that was just a kind of just a fact that my mother, but it's interesting that perhaps on a subconscious level, my nervous system would have adapted and adopted to the environment of not feeling wanted. And I guess this is as we are further, much further along now on the pathway of really tuning into to what's happening. I obviously said, I obviously said a trigger word there. Um, so that got her attention. As we're tuning in, I don't know if it's we're tuning. Uh, into kind of what's happening inside our body, we may still have a, a, quite a bit of conflict. We may still have a lot of pushing and pulling between our conscious and our subconscious. Now, last week I talked about um, the concept of what if our body was our subconscious? What if our brain was our conscious or our mind was our consciousness and our body was our subconscious? And, and again, I got I kind of like got my head going, wow, I, yeah. So if the body is like showing up signs and symptoms because they, there are suppressed and repressed feelings and thoughts and beliefs that perhaps in inverted commas don't fit into a, either the view that we have of ourselves or the view that our parents wanted us to have, what, what might be lying there? And, and, and what I've learned uh, and I'm always learning. So I, I love this journey because I never think I know it all. I'm, and the more I learn, the realize the less I know. And it excites me beyond belief because our bodies are incredible. We all have the innate capacity to, you know, uh, heal our bodies, heal our emotions and heal our own traumas and things. We do have that. But sometimes we need that support. And we need that external guidance as to, to give us the reassurance that our younger parts are needing. And this is why, um, I'm going to, as you know, I'm sending out the recovery of the inner child book, because I think if you can allow yourself um, from uh, knowing it's from a, a position of strength, that there is a younger, more vulnerable part that you perhaps had to disown or separate from because it wasn't safe, because you learned quite early on that it wasn't safe for you to, to be a child in vertical commas, 
on my own journey, I learned that I had to take care of everybody. I had to parent my parents. I remember seeing this psychologist um, after my daughter was born, I had a, a, a severe depressive episode because my daughter was born and within, I think about, you know, I mean, from the moment of seeing her, I realized that that was love. That, and then from that, that the, 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 the sadness that came with that was, I knew then that I had never had that. I'd never experienced the love that I had for my daughter. And then it just seemed to spark, open up this whole thing for me where I started to kind of think, you know, th there must be something wrong with me at my core. And, and this is where I'm coming to is, A, to reassure you, there's nothing wrong with you at your core. You are not a bad person. You're not an unpleasant person. You may have had things projected onto you or you've taken things in as being your stuff. And this is, again, what we're going to keep working on. And we'll keep just, just shining a little bit of light on and just gently kind of become curious about and just notice kind of what's coming up as, as we're continuing to do this work, because this is really important. This is why I believe, you know, I ended up chronically bedridden and disabled for two and a half years because I refused stubbornly to look at all this stuff. I was very philosophical and very kind of like, no, I should be over this stuff by now. And how can it be my past? And, and my view of my past was very kind of almost fear to even acknowledge the reality of my past. And then to be fair, the reality I thought that was my past and my family, I thought that was normal. I didn't realize, I realize now in hindsight, it was very dysfunctional. It was actually quite abusive physically and emotionally. And I didn't even have a clue. I had no concept, but obviously some part of me was going, right, okay, we are just shutting this hole. We're going on strike until you think and feel and, and explore gently and safely what might have happened in the past that has um, causing uh, suppression of feelings and thoughts that perhaps you're not comfortable with. And of course, I recognize on my own journey, there was things going on that I didn't want to see. I used to have this saying that it was kind of like, um, I used to give people three, three strikes and then they're out. Whereas now I'm like, you get one chance and then I know what type of person you are. Um, but obviously history had taught me to, um, to interact and, and be in a certain way around people for survival. So I learned very early on that I had to parent everybody. I had to look after everybody. I had to, to entertain everyone, keep everyone happy. Um, and my any idea of attention or anything on me was just like I, d I didn't want it. You know, it was, I, I wanted it on other people and on me because it wasn't safe for it to be on me. So a as a result of whatever's happened in your life, you've adapted to your environment. So this is where, as we've got, like, as I say, we've got Poppy here who has actually fallen asleep, which is amazing. Um, it must be the sound of my voice. Um, that, and that's the thing, you know, did, did we, I know that I didn't get held enough or touched enough because when my children either put their hand on my back, I go, oh, that's so nice. Or, and, and it's taken me years to even just acknowledge that that is something that, oh, that was so lovely and not feel kind of, brittle and kind of uh, rejecting of these kind of things because I didn't know what to do with these feelings before. So what, what we're looking to do continually is just really stay curious and mindful and open of what's happening. Our bodies are incredible. They're currently trying to speak to you. And again, I'm not talking from a woo-woo perspective here or humming or chanting or drumming, whatever, which, which again, if you, these things you like and they work for you, brilliant. I'm talking from a purely scientific, biological, physiological fact. There is, if there's pain or symptoms showing up in your body, your body is trying to communicate to you in some way, shape or form that something's not quite right. Or there's something in the subconscious midbrain that has been triggered or, uh, I mean, my belief is our bodies are always trying to communicate to us. I don't know whether you want to say that's a subconscious thing or not. For me, the subconscious lies in midbrain and reptilian brain, which kind of sit, you know, at the very back of the brain and go down the spinal cord. It's the oldest part of the brain. And that part of the brain, as you know, keeps all the, the, the heart pumping and the blood flowing and, and all the kind of stuff that goes on, you know, from a survival perspective. Then in the midbrain, which as you know, is one of the biggest brains, it's got the emotional brain. There's a lot of stuff stored in there. And, and sometimes there's a lot of stuff that hasn't been processed. And sometimes we don't even know that it's not been processed. But I'm, I'm kind of guessing that at this particular point, that there's probably a bit of stuff that needs to be processed. But 
what, what I'm trying to say to you is you can't fast track this and you can't sort of compartmentalize it and you can't sort of like put it on a conveyor belt. Invariably in my experience, by the time someone's reached this particular point of their journey, there's a really frightened little girl inside. And this is why we've got these little, little illustrations being done, because I want you to kind of really um, think about the little you um, from, from, from birth to probably about two or three. If you think that um, up to the age of two, you have no language. You're basically a sensory feeling being that is born into this sensory overload and if you're not held, if you're maybe, maybe you were put straight into a plastic uh, cot by the bedside, or maybe you were put into a plastic cot amongst other babies. I don't know what your early experiences were, but the chances are um, you didn't get what you needed as, as you were growing up, which created a kind of a thermostat in your nervous system. In fact, I read something the other day that said our our immune system is always circulating in our nervous system. I kind of talked about the nervous system and the immune system being like twin sisters. If the nervous system is constantly on and high, then it impairs the immune system. But the idea of the immune system, of course, is constantly in the nervous system. You know, it's like a background operating system. So the only way um, to slowly, safely, gently, and lovingly um, look at what what has gone on in the past is by increasing awareness and, and what I mean by that is when we're looking to increase our awareness we do so with the absolute respect of all of our parts there's a lot of new age psychology out there there's a lot of stuff that's incredibly dangerous there's a lot of um that that sort of snapchat oh let's let, let's just kind of let's you know say one mantra and you're fixed I think it's very disrespectful to what's going on in, inside and very disrespectful to, to human beings in general especially if they've experienced a lot of trauma or upset that may be um, in the subconscious what women with endometriosis have to put up with over and above whatever has happened in their past is basically the abuse that they get from the medical field I, I get emails, I get hundreds of emails a day, or my team do, you know, and the stories that, that come through are, are heart-wrenching. You know, the abuse, I've got ladies coming through my program at the moment, they're literally getting bombarded by the gynecologist and their secretaries, they're getting bullied into making appointments to have their surgery. So, so not only will you have gone through some aspect that has been unsettling to your nervous system, but you've obviously had to adapt to that unsettledness as you were younger and getting older. And then just to add insult to injury, you show up with all these symptoms that are real. They're real, tangible pain signs and symptoms. And with a lot of women, they're told that it's all in their head. I mean, it's just awful, absolutely awful. And then that adds another layer that adds another layer of not feeling validated, not being seen, not being heard which may in turn feed in to whatever happened when you were little. Now, as I say, you know, when you think back through uh, the Second World War, for example, I mean, that is only like two or three generations ago or three generations ago. It's Poppy snoring now. Um, how come you're sleeping now? You're supposed to sleep earlier. Uh, well, you're supposed to be sleeping now in your bed, but never mind. But if you think back to um, the Second World War, and some of the things that, that our ancestors will have seen during those times. And I guarantee you very few, if any people actually had support emotionally or support psychologically to process the trauma that would have occurred, it's highly unlikely. Um, and, or it would have taken a long time or there was just that kind of very stoic kind of attitude of well, we just have to carry on because there's no choice. Um, so if you think that these things may well add another layer, another level to what, what we as women with endometriosis, thank goodness I don't have that anymore. I don't have adenomyosis. I have no pain, no symptoms, no breast tenderness, no bowel pain. I still have nothing, you know, and, and I literally thank God every day because, you know, I, I I'm so, feel so blessed to be here. And this is why I do what I do now so that you can get here too. But if you can think of like, you know, what might have been passed down through the generations from a um, from an emotional perspective and how that emotion, this is why I'm, I'm, I've been doing the Ultimate Emotional Health Summit and things, because what I want to do is expand people's awareness as to 
just how poor we all are around the world at emotional health. There's the physical health and the medical field are, are you know, um, are, all, are, are, you know, are all over that, the pharmaceutical industries. Um, I'm sure the, uh, is, it, is it Pfizer that, you know, are doing the vaccines and things at the moment? I mean, they must be just jumping, jumping up and down for joy and celebrating at the prospect of that. I mean, I have to say personally, makes me quite uncomfortable the idea of a vaccine because unless you kind of know all the ingredients that are in there our bodies tend to be quite sensitive to these things so it's going to be interesting to see how all that pans out but hey we've got the physical health people get people know that pain signs symptoms and then you've got the medical field that kind of um in many cases make us worse because they don't teach us how to listen to our body they just encourage that dis disassociation from our body by giving us a painkiller to drugs or surgery and then we we kind of pass on our responsibility of our body onto them because that's just culturally and, and societally that's how we've all been conditioned and then you've got mental health you know again you've got people who who kind of get that now but when it comes to emotional health and spiritual health and you know these are four things and i'm going to be uh, talking next week and over the next couple of weeks about about the spiritual health and again i'm not talking from a woo-woo perspective or or uh lighting incense candle or anything like that again if you do that's great but i'm not talking from that perspective. i'm talking from a very uh, biological and physiological perspective um but you know when it comes to emotional health i i i think that many of us are are just we didn't even know it existed <laughs> how can you know that you're devoid or repressing certain feelings and emotions if you didn't even know that they existed in the first place. And I think that is the biggest problem. And I guess that's what I'm trying to see here in the feel it section is I really encourage you to step into you and just become explorative. Now there's a lot of content on the membership site. So please make sure to go in and have a look at the embracing emotions. There's lots of handouts and downloads and stuff. And I encourage you just for especially that's why I use a lot of color and visual stuff, especially for, for the younger parts of you, okay? Because, uh, and it might feel frivolous and it might feel kind of like, um, you know, silly to kind of like uh, have these pictures. But what we're looking to do is we, we're all very left brained uh, and very prefrontal cortex when we start this journey. We're, we're trying to make, uh, we're trying to analyze and philosophize about what's happened. But actually, we also need to come into the feeling state. But feelings for the majority of women with endometriosis is a terrifying concept. And I and my belief is that we, we've shoved those feelings down because we didn't know what to do with them. Nobody taught us to, what to do with them. And they themselves created um, energy blockages um, or, or cause a lot of um, some recent studies have said uh when they obviously subconsciously that there is a perceived threat it could be real it could be unreal but there's a perceived threat by the brain then the oxygen is um then there's tension develops in the body so if you've got an overactive nervous system or just a nervous system that, that reacts very sensitively to the environment or food or product thing um that in itself can sometimes cause a lot of tension and thereby causing that tension, it restricts blood flow. So it's kind of like a knock on effect. And by restricting blood flow, it, it impairs the body ability to, to do what it needs to do, which is through the mitochondria, is through the, get oxygen into the cells, expel waste and, um, and, and all these kind of things. So you can see how by us paying attention to our emotions, now. And again, this is where I'm going to come back to, to um, really staining the paper with ink, however you want to talk about it. It's a, a, a great way not only to track your journey so that you can share your story with other people when you've come through, because I know you'll come through because you're here and you wouldn't be here if you didn't have that strength and tenacity in you. But also so you can track your progress and you can develop compassion. That was one of the, the biggest, <laughs> there was a few big things for me, but one of the the biggest things was um, learning to have compassion for myself. That, that was a big, big thing. I was incredibly tough, incredibly hard. And I think this image here shows it perfectly well. This was the critic. It's kind of like, I didn't do it enough. I didn't do it. I should have done it more. I should have done it more perfectly. And I had a big, big critic that really kind of beat me to a pulp. So 
learning to have compassion for myself. And I think I have to show you the next image here. Where is it, Poppy? Where is it? Where's it gone? Where is it? Be the last one, won't it? Here it is. This is what we're going to be keeping working on is developing your own inner parent, your own inner parent or grandparent, some, some part of you that can really take care of you. Because I was speaking to um, another end of boss today and, and, and what was lovely to hear is this sudden awakening or she said, I, I, I got scared by something, but then I thought, okay, well, I need to take care of myself. So what, what kind of words can I say to myself? What, what, what would, if I was a mum to myself, what would I be saying? If I was a parent to myself, what would I be saying right now? So this is what we're going to keep drawing attention to as well, is whilst we're perhaps unearthing what might be happening when we were young, that we didn't have the word, because when you're young, you don't have the words, <laughs> stop it stickly we don't stop it uh, we don't actually have the words for the feeling states i think that's what i'm trying to say so therefore emotions show up when we're older because and sometimes you might be surprised by your emotions i i always know when there's a past that's been triggered when i have a an emotional reaction to something that is disproportionate what I feel there should be an apportionate kind of reaction and, and almost a disproportionate reaction. That's when I know that there is a past, uh, there's some past sort of elements to what it is that's come up for me that I maybe just need to journal about. And of course, the other thing is to meditate about. Um, I'm getting a bit of wriggly here. No, no, here we go. So that's where meditation again, or mindfulness or relaxation is, is crucial. Because if you swing right back to what I was saying earlier about the nervous system and the immune system, um, about how the, the, we, we need the nervous system to become as relaxed as possible, which isn't always easy for us because if we're perfectionists and pushers uh, types of personality, which most of us are, um, then we're used to always pushing on and pushing through, which again, admirable qualities and we don't want rid of them. What we do want is them in balance a little bit. And this is where by doing relaxation, mindfulness, meditation, we not only increase um, the, uh, the nervous system being reduced, but we also increase oxygen getting in and around our body as well. Remember I was saying earlier, if there's tension develops in the body, and the tension can show up in many different ways, your neck, head and shoulder pain, migraines, uh, stomach, your stomach and knots, all these kind of things, your jaw, <coughs> excuse me, then these are the kind of things that we're, we're always looking to kind of, um, as much as we can, <coughs> excuse me, is that you? <laughs> as much as we can um, positively influence our bodies and obviously our, our nervous system. And, and equally, what's wonderful about meditation, relaxation, especially guided meditation, and Kelly Howell is is one of my favorites, is it gets into the subconscious and, and is more imagery based. So that allows, you know, if you, again, if you think when you were little, you were very image uh, aware, weren't you? You were color aware, image aware, because that's how you learned. And then as you get older, we shift away from right brain into left brain, which is all kind of lines, linears and words. Um, but we are feeling beings and again, sometimes when we're, we're trying to put uh, feelings to words, um, then it really helps to have imagery and things to do so. So this is why the recovery of the inner child is such an important book. And um, we're gonna be talking more about that over the next couple of weeks as well, because I'm going to be encouraging you to, if you feel comfortable, to share little drawings. Again, you can do it th through email, but even if you if you feel like, and I'm talking emotions that aren't socially acceptable or aren't socially, most people are comfortable. And I'm talking about rage and anger and depression and, pardon me, um, uh, all, I mean, I've got a kaleidoscope here of all these kind of, in inverted commas, unpleasant emotions that society says we shouldn't have. But we're a human being. Now, we're not saying to act out the, the rage and the anger, obviously. But what we are, I mean, if you have to go and punch a pillow, then punch a pillow. If you have to write that you're livid and furious and, and how dare they and, and, and feel uh, slighted or blighted, 
then you have to do it because if you don't, it stays stored in your body or at least then become aware of what's happening. And I think, I think of what I'm trying to convey is this isn't woo woo stuff. I've said this three times today. It's not woo woo. This is science based that if we don't connect to our emotions, I, I did a, um, a podcast uh, yesterday, which I talked about the gift of grief. Um, the gift of grief is poppy for me because had I not grieved uh, Jinty, she wouldn't be here now. I would have deprived myself of this joy and this love and, and all these kisses and things because I would have switched off and numbed out from my grief and thereby I would have uh, suppressed everything. And then I would have, the pain would have got bigger and, and, and mounted more and I would have, have shied away from it. And that's what tends to happen if we don't, if we aren't taught by our caregivers or our parents, A, that that feeling state might, or A, you have a feeling state, B, that feeling state has a word and a language attached to it, then we don't know what to do with it. And that's where a lot of the times we just want to stay numb, where, where our, our kind of default state is, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to feel it because what, what does that mean if we do that? Because there's that feeling of that um, power of um, like an electrical circuit, you know, getting too much power coming through and then a fuse being blown. And in the past, we would go from fight flight into freeze and fold because there was just too much sensory information coming in. And perhaps you had too much coming in at any one time. I know myself, for me, there was a number of different things happened. Shushed. A number of different things happened. Shushed. No. You see, you'll sleep next time in your bed. Um, there's a number of different, oh my goodness, she's getting restless, aren't you? Obviously likes facing this way. Um, there was too many sensory things came in at one time. There was, there was a lot of toxic people. There was a lot of bad foods, bad products, bad people. There was a lot of different things that came in in, in one fell swoop. And then I didn't know how to handle or how to manage it, what was happening. I didn't know safe ways. I didn't know about the journaling. I didn't know about the meditation. I didn't know about reaching out to safe people for support and counsel and things as well. So there was all these kind of things that uh, amounted into suppression and repression of feelings um, that I didn't know what to do with. And of course, when you shove them down, they don't just disappear. They, they stay stuck, you know, as of molecules of emotion. We are living feeling beings with vibrational energy you just need to look at cells and things and again this is coming from a, a physiological perspective so it's very important to think about that when you're maybe beating yourself up as like uh, if you're having thoughts and feelings remember little you maybe didn't get the explanation or the background the information and the knowledge that you're getting now that you're learning about yourself now so I'm going to encourage you for this week as part of your homework is if you feel comfortable and I would love to see it. If you want to draw, say, uh, two unpleasant feeling states and draw two pleasant feeling states, they can be whatever you want. Um, I think I explained last week I had fear for me was me popping my head at the top of a shell. Um, anger was me kind of like, I had a big, my mouth was open like in that, that, that painting, the scream. And, you know, and again, me sort of jumping up and down when I was happy. So again, even if it's stick thing, you know, don't judge it, don't criticize it. I'm gonna encourage you just to doodle, just to play around with the concept of trying to, um, if you look at children, you know, young children, they, they draw their, their upset and their sadness and they, they, they keep things fluid um, in, in that respect. So um, that's what we're still trying to do as we're humans, as we're humans, as, as humans, as we're still moving through. So. So that is us for today. Um, so that's your homework is to, again, you should be getting this book very soon. It has been ordered. And, um, and I hope you enjoy because it's, it's, it allowed me personally to, to develop the compassion that I needed to move forward. Um, because I was very kind of harsh, left brain, analytical, uh, et cetera. And the idea of, of parts and, uh, being compassionate to myself just just seemed a, a wee bit wishy-washy and, and a bit far-fetched for me so if you're still got elements of that don't worry that's completely natural but what we're looking to do is ultimately in fact I've got oh dropped our cat 
um, nice picture here we? of all our parts. This is what we're looking to do is to bring to have a really caring parenting part in the middle who can parent all our parts. So you'll see that there's a jumping part and there's a you know, peaceful part and there's a happy part and playful part along with all our other parts. So that's ultimately what we're looking to do is just, you know, keep our parts in balance, but we have to notice them first. Um, I mean, I do have some names to them, but I want you to, to observe yourself if you can identify in your own uh, journalings and things like what they might be for you. And um, just, just gently kind of go along as if it's a game, kind of like, oh, what part would this be? And obviously keep journaling. I've got a fantastic new journal coming out at the beginning of the year. Um, it's uh, with the designer at the moment, getting the, the front page, so there'll be a free one coming out to you anyway. And, and the essence is taking you through, just, just gently taking you through a couple of pages a day and getting you to think and asking you some questions and things like that. So, so again, it's in, a, it's in a proper kind of, it'll be this size, uh, you know, with lines and, and um, as I say, with guides and with, with kind of thoughts and feelings and just to kind of uh, gently encourage if you're still feeling some resistance as to how we can just gently tap into these things in a way that feels comfortable, but also just keeping us growing in our awareness and keeping us growing in our connection and compassion to ourselves. So keep up the great work. And Poppy, you gonna say goodbye? Say bye-bye. And um, yeah, keep looking after yourself. Keep keep doing the daily basics. They are so key to this journey. And um, And if you need us, you know where we are and we will be back here next week. Okay, take care. Thanks for listening to Heal Endometriosis Naturally with Wendy K. Laidlaw. And I hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and rate us. If you're interested in learning more, you can download your top five jumpstart tips at healendometriosisnaturally.com and jump on the VIP email list. Remember to keep you number one. The world needs a healthy you.